Meaning to weave in Sanskrit, the term Tantra implies a set of spiritual practices that direct the universal energies into the practitioner, thereby leading to liberation from the physical level of existence. The tools one may use in tantric practice include things such as mantras, meditation, and mudras, which are positions of the body, especially the hands, that have some kind of influence on the subtle energies of the body or your mood. This is the real significance behind the Masonic hand gestures, which may be used as a subtle form of communication to other members, but in a more esoteric sense are employed in the harnessing and manipulation of energies, sometimes called chi, ki, orgon, prana, and vril. To put it in more practical and blunt terms, this energy is closely related to sex energy and is at the root of all mystery schools and religions. This universal energy is also referred to as light in many occult circles with very high vibratory etheric properties, also called Lucifer, which is another term for light or literally bearer of light. Alan Watts was a British philosopher who popularized Eastern esoteric philosophy for a Western audience. Born in England, he moved to the United States in 1938 where he pursued Zen training in New York and received a master's degree in theology. Watts went on to gain a large following, writing more than 25 books and articles, as well as recorded talks which still shimmer with a profound and galvanizing lucidity. The tantric sexual practice is allowing it to happen without forcing sexual relationship in any way. It, it tends to be a, a sexual type of relationship which you could call contemplative rather than active. If you see the statues of uh, tantric figures, by and large, the male figure is seated in the lotus posture, like a Buddha, like the Buddha here. The female sits right on his lap, wraps her legs round his waist and her arms round his neck. And they touch at all points, the mouth, the breasts, the sexual organs, the eyes looking straight into each other. But they're motionless. They're completely still. They don't, in other words, uh, work towards an, an orgasm. See, Freud had the idea that sexual pleasure is release from tension. That uh, what we work towards is the orgasm as detumescence, as escape from tension. But many people would disagree most strongly with this and say that's part of it, but that it is just as wonderful for there to be tension without any attempt to escape from it. Maintain the tension. Just let it happen. That is the attitude of these sexual images in the, of the sexual yoga. To let it happen and to be completely still and completely open and aware. And if you do this, you'll find a very strange thing happens. You will become the other person. You will experience yourselves as a single organism where the two bodies literally melt into each other. It's as if there is electric currents or something in our bodies which ordinarily uh, bat against each other. But in this way of sexual yoga, the two currents become a single current. And it's exactly melting is the only way I could describe it, the best metaphor. The two bodies fuse. Some say that in the tantric exercise there is no orgasm. 
it is entirely what's called coitus reservatus, that, uh, or carezza, to use the Persian word. And that the sexual energy is thereby transmuted into spiritual energy. Some say, you know, you arouse the sexual energy, but instead of dissipating it, you send it up the spinal column into the brain. <clears throat> you all know, presumably, the symbolism of yoga, of the kundalini, that at the base of the spine there is the call of the, the serpent. Kundalini, the serpent power. And that the object of yoga is to send your concentrated energy down your spine to knock on that snake's head and say, wake up, man, go up the tree. And the snake wakes up and he goes slowly up the spine, energizing each chakra or center of nervous, uh, nervous telephone exchange. Each one, as he gets into it, boom, a new world is open to you. Boom, boom. Finally, he gets into the thousand-petal lotus in the head. And then everything is lit up. You know all things. And eventually, he goes out through the top of the head, where there's the sun door. The head corresponds to the firmament of heaven. The sun is the door in the firmament through which you see into the transcendental world. Sexual energy is the kundalini, is the serpent power, is the divine power. If you dissipate it in orgasm, you'll lose it. If you conserve it, you raise the power, raise the orgiastic feeling, but don't have orgasm. Instead, direct the sexual energy up the spine into the head, you'll get illumination. And many tantrics practice this way. They uh, use the intense fascination of sexual arousal to be the instrument, the incentive for intense concentration on each other. So that you look with the whole, uh, you see, supposing you look into the other partner's eyes and your interest in the other person's eyes is coupled with sexual fascination you have colossal power of concentration. Look and look and look and look and look and look into those eyes. Now, if you concentrate long enough, you go into trance, and if you know how to handle trance, you go through trance into samadhi and so on and so on. Samadhi is a state of consciousness characterized by clarity of perception and the absence of ego. It's the state of consciousness sought by all schools of meditation, a piercing of the veils of one's own subconscious mind into the superconscious. It is in this ecstatic state that the phrase, as above, so below, reveals its guarded occult meaning, where an individual is said to be able to perceive or even influence events outside of himself or herself. Samuel Ayn Wayor was a spiritual teacher and author of over 60 books of esoteric spirituality. He taught and formed groups under the banner of Universal Gnosticism or simply Gnosis. Born in Bogota, Colombia, he published a book entitled The Perfect Matrimony that claim to unveil the secret of sexuality as the cornerstone of the world's great religions. That was a great initiate that uh, Master Samael Onveor knew in South America, whose name was the Dr. Arnold Krumheller, a great uh, physician, doctor, from the University of Berlin. His inner name was Guiracocha. Master Samael Onveor mentioned Guiracocha in the, his book, The Perfect Matrimony. And he said, this is the mystery of Baphomet. Instead of the coitus, which reaches the orgasm, sweet caresses, amorous phrases, and delicate touching should be lavished reflectively. 
keeping the mind constantly separated from animal sexuality, sustaining the purest spirituality as if the act were a true religious ceremony. Nevertheless, the man can and should introduce the penis and keep it inside the feminine sex to bring about a divine sensation upon both, full of joy, that can last for hours, withdrawing it at the moment the orgasm is near to avoid the ejaculation of semen. The transmission of magnetic fluids is ordinarily done through the hands and through the eyes. But it is necessary to say that there is no greater and more powerful conductor, a thousand times more powerful, a thousand times superior to others than the virile member and the vulva as receptive organs. This is what Master Wiracocha said. He, in other words, were disclosing the power of Baphomet. But many people didn't understand, even though he was also clear. This is the mystery of Baphomet. This is what the Master Samael Onveo wrote in the book Igneous Rose. He says, the rose elaborates its perfume with the clay of the earth which is the physicality. The slithering worm does not like the gardener who removes its clay. Our disciples will now comprehend on what basis do the tenebrous ones qualify the sexual alchemists as thieves. And the proof is this. When you read the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 25, the very bottom of that uh, chapter, it is written, and they were both naked. But we put in parentheses the word that they use for naked. If you copy that word and put it in the dictionary, you will see that it has many meanings. And what of the meanings is thievish. And it's because it is precisely what an alchemist, a Templar, the one that knows the mystery of Baphomet does. He steals the sexual force of nature. You have to know how to steal the energy from your own physicality because that physicality, that flesh, is your own body. Matthew Samuel says, or the Genesis says, and they were both Thievish, Adam and his wife, and were not ashamed. Because they were stealing from their own development, spiritual development. Now the devotees of the path will understand why Christ said, The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Because this is how you develop the forces of heaven within you. The forces of heaven descends in your physicality. And you take it by force, by willpower. It's not easy. The weak succumb in the sexual act. And that's the mystery of Baphomet. You have to be a thief. And that's why the tenebrous, the fornicators from Klipoth accuse the alchemists of being thieves. Because we... When we transmute, we are really thieves. We like to steal for God. But it's not a stealing like in this physical world, money or dollars, because that's stupid. It's stealing from his own energy, his own force, his own physicality. And you transmute the sexual force. That's the mystery of Baphomet. That is taught by Moses through his Kabbalah. In all the book of Genesis. When you are in the sexual act. You are touching the tree of life. But remember. The commandment. Don't eat of it. You touch the, the tree. And you eat the fruit. And that's precisely the problem. You can touch it. 
But don't eat it. Because by touching it is how you transform the energy and feed your spirit, your soul. But if you eat it, when you fornicate, you make lust and then the rest of egos inside. And you become idolatrous. Even if you don't have in your home statues and you think that only God you worship, but you are a fornicator, you are also a killer. Because you are killing the life. Or as in esotericism we say, any bodhisattva that falls into animal generation is accused of having killed the god Mercury. Or the Mercurius, which is the sexual energy. What are you performing when you are in fornication? The Zohar explains the different. You are a thief as well, but a bad thief. After the orgasm. Of the animals. And the serpent said unto the woman. This is the next uh, graphic. Ye shall not surely die. For Elohim doth know. That in the day you eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as Elohim. Knowing good and evil. But when you eat it. As God or with God, together with God, and you eat it, and then your eyes are open. But it's written that Adam and Eve, or whether Eve tasted the fruit, which was the orgasm, that they taste and give it to the brain. And both saw that they were naked completely, without energy, without force. So we have two serpents here. The first is the tempting serpent, and the other is the, the serpent that gives life, which is the Kundalini. Humanity is following, of course, the tempting serpent. Because in the sexual embrace, when the flesh is receiving that magnetism in male and female, they enter into the temple, but to fornicate. And that's precisely to filth the tabernacle of God. Not to eat means to perform the sexual act and to transmute. To eat means to reach the orgasm, the spasm of the animals. Which in this planet Earth, everybody is eating, having a fist of the apple of the tree. Right? But uh, you have to be careful. Because in the sexual act, you have to be, if you want to learn, you have to start little by little. Don't start like great uh, master of Tantra, you know, that practice hours. The master uh, with a kosha says, they can endure, can endure for hours, right? But you say, oh, the master with a kosha says, that can endure for hours, but you are not a master, he was a master with a culture. He says, you have to start. The master Samael says, you have to start for five minutes, 15 minutes, or as much as you can tolerate in order to teach your body because the serpent is wiser. You know, is a wiser animal of all the hayot that were created. So, uh, you said that um, well, it says in, the, in Genesis, you shall not touch it. But then you, then you said, we can touch the tree. So which, which one is it? We, we can touch it. We can't touch it. It's obviously... What Jehovah Elohim said is that you shall not eat of it. Right? And the woman says, not even touch it. Right? But then the serpent, according to Zohar, Zohar, said, no, no, no. The thing is, you shall not eat. You can touch it. Look, I touch it and I don't die. Hmm? And it's true. Because the Elohim touching and I don't die. But if you eat it, you will die. But uh, and then when Eve said, okay, I will touch it and I will try not to eat it. But she ate it and gave it to Adam. And they liked the orgasm. He says, oh, this is a good fruit. He says, uh, you forgot about that. This is uh, for animals, not for us. And then they are kicked out of eating, etc., etc. We draw. Before the orgasm. This is the way in order to be born again. Another question. Does, um, 
What is the karma of a man or a woman who cannot reach orgasm? The karma. There's no karma there. In this case, for a for a woman that cannot reach the orgasm, why, if you cannot reach the orgasm, you have to fight for it? It says, you cannot be an animal because you don't reach the orgasm. Then fight in order to be an animal. That's incongruent. In this day and age, it's precisely what people receive, teachings. That uh, some women are difficult to reach the orgasm, so they have to teach her. Women are, in past times, chased by, by, by nature. But in this day and age, there's a lot of pornography there and filthy things that teach the woman how to fornicate, how to reach the orgasm, and that's bad. In other words, how to, uh, the woman had to be more bestial as she already is, and how the man can be more bestial as he already is. But uh, remember, the choice is yours. Take the path of the good or the evil. It's up to you. When you are in a sexual act, that is one. And if you pollute the sexual act, you are insulting that only God within you. Thank you very much. Ecstasy or samadhi is not a nebulous state, but a transcendental state of wonderment, which is associated with perfect mental clarity. On one given night, while in profound internal meditation, I abandoned this illusory world of Maya. Thus, liberated from the shackles of this bitter existence, I submerged myself into samadhi within the world of the spirit. There is no better pleasure than feeling oneself as a soul detached from the body, the affections, and the mind. Samuel Ann Weyor Wilhelm Reich was born on March 24, 1897, on a small farm in what is now the Ukraine. A student of psychology, at the age of 23, he became one of Freud's prized associates and began a private practice as an analytic psychiatrist. As a pioneer in the study of human sexuality, he used novel experimental methods to examine, analyze, and measure various aspects of physical lovemaking. He concluded that the ability to love was dependent on one's physical ability to make love with what he described as orgastic potency and coined the term orgon energy, as in the word orgasm or organism, to describe a biological energy that he claimed he had discovered or at least rediscovered in modern times. It is April 3rd, 1952, I, Wilhelm Reich, I happen to discover the life energy. I know what it means for the future development of medicine, biology, philosophy, and natural science. I'm fully aware of it, and in, these, in this awareness, I am completely alone. There's nobody here to listen to what I'm saying. The recording apparatus is the only witness. I hope that someone will at some time in the future listen to this recording with great respect for the courage that was necessary to sustain the research work in organ energy and life energy all through these years. It would appear that this seemingly high frequency ether-like energy may simply be an unrecognized form of bioelectromagnetism, a universal energy that the ancient Chinese culture called Qi, the Japanese referred to as Qi, the Sanskrit word for the same concept is prana, and ka is the Egyptian word for it. The ka was the ancient Egyptian concept of vital essence, 
which distinguishes the differences between the living and the dead, with death occurring when the Ka leaves the body. And this resembles the concept of spirit in other religions. The Ankh is an ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic ideograph symbolizing life. And in some esoteric circles, Ankhing is a term given to the occult practice of directly working with this universal energy. In ancient Egypt, it was believed that the orgasm was the key to eternal life and that vital life force was dissipated and lost with ejaculation. This is the true reason behind circumcision and vows of celibacy in the context of semen retention. Also, the cornerstone of Taoist and Tibetan Tantra where an initiate learns to control the orgasm and therefore the flow of their sexual energy up instead of out. They believe that if this energy is controlled, the human orgasm becomes a source of infinite pranic or vril energy that is not lost. Vril is the term used by the German Vril Society, which was formed well before World War II and dedicated to the study and practice of metaphysics, covertly conducting research into psychic phenomenon and this universal energy. Their secret society members, which included some who would later become notable members of the Nazi party, were said to have allegedly ended up in Antarctica by the end of World War II. Sigmund Freud was the famous founder of psychoanalysis and believed that refraining from sex provided mental and physical benefits. According to his biographer, Ernest Jones, and I quote, Freud held the opinion, based on personal experience and observation, that sexual activity was incompatible with the accomplishing of any great work. Since he felt that the great work of creating and establishing psychotherapy was his destiny, he told his wife that they could no longer engage in sexual relations. Indeed, from about age 40 until his death, Freud was absolutely celibate in order to, quote, sublimate the libido for creative purposes. Sir Isaac Newton, scientist and mathematician, was a lifelong celibate who was believed to have died a virgin. In a letter to philosopher John Locke, he writes, and I quote, the way to chastity is not to struggle with incontinent thoughts, but to avert the thoughts by some employment or by reading or by meditating on other things. According to this BBC article, Nikola Tesla, legendary scientist and inventor, quote, believed that celibacy spurred on the brain. Mahatma Gandhi, freedom fighter, said, and I quote, we have considered how to keep good health on what it depends and how to conserve it. If all men always followed the rules of health and observed unbroken celibacy, the chapters of this book that follow would not be necessary because such men cannot possibly suffer any physical or mental illness. Michelangelo's contemporary, Asano Candivi, who was also his biographer, described Michelangelo as having, quote, monk-like chastity. Pythagoras, philosopher and mathematician, Pythagoras himself established a small community that set a premium on study, vegetarianism, and sexual restraint or abstinence. Later philosophers believed that celibacy would be conducive to the detachment and equilibrium required by the philosopher's calling. And what of the Greek philosopher Plato? Plato's dialogue stresses the intellect over the physical because of the risk of slavish dependence on physical desires. In this context, 
Plato recommends reduced erotic engagement to better exercise and control the mind. In other words, sexual activity is only detrimental only insofar as it distracts from intellectual endeavors. Plato praises this exemplary self-control, citing a famous athlete who had possessed in his soul such art and such courage, mixed with moderation, that he never touched a woman, or boy for that matter, during the entire time of his training. Plato suggests that by consciously choosing to control sexual desires, an individual liberates the mind to better study virtue. The Greek philosopher Socrates first prescribes abstinence from sexual pleasure, a conventionalized treatment of his view on sex then follows, which illustrates and amplifies the earlier summary treatment of its dangers. Xenophon makes the wrong move and finds that though sex may be a pleasure, it makes you a slave. The Dalai Lama, spiritual leader of Tibet, once said, and I quote, Sexual pleasure, sexual desire, actually, I think is short period satisfaction and, often, that leads to more complication. The following excerpt is from chapter 11 of a book authored by Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich about the transmutation of sex energy. Sex transmutation is simple and easily explained. It means the switching of the mind from thoughts of physical expression to thoughts of some other nature. Sex desire is the most powerful of human desires. When driven by this desire, men develop keenness of imagination, courage, willpower, persistence, and creative ability unknown to them at other times. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual contact that men freely run the risk of life and reputation to indulge it. When harnessed and redirected along other lines, this motivating force maintains all of its attributes of keenness of imagination, courage, etc., which may be used as powerful creative forces in literature, art, or any other profession or calling, including, of course, the accumulation of riches. The transmutation of sexual energy calls for the exercise of willpower, to be sure, but the reward is worth the effort. The desire for sexual expression is inborn and natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it should be given an outlet through forms of expression which enrich the body, mind, and spirit of man. If not given this form of outlet, through transmutation, it will seek outlets through purely physical channels. A river may be dammed and its water controlled for a time, but eventually it will force an outlet. The same is true of the emotion of sex. It may be submerged and controlled for a time, but its very nature causes it to be ever-seeking means of expression. If it is not transmuted into some creative effort, it will find a less worthy outlet. Fortunate, indeed, is the person who has discovered how to give sex emotion an outlet through some form of creative effort, for he has, by that discovery, lifted himself to the status of a genius. The men of greatest achievement are men with highly developed sex natures, men who have learned the art of sex transmutation. The men who have accumulated great fortunes and achieved outstanding recognition in literature, art, industry, architecture, and the professions were motivated by the influence of a woman. When driven by this emotion, men become gifted with a superpower for action. Understand this truth, and you will catch the significance of the statement that sex transmutation will lift one to the status of a genius. The emotion of sex contains the secret of creative ability. The desire for sex expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli which most effectively step up the vibrations of the mind and start the wheels of physical action. 
But the emotion of sex is by great odds the most intense and powerful of all mind stimuli. Transmutation of sex energy may lift one to the status of a genius. A man who has discovered how to increase the vibrations of thought to the point where he can freely communicate with sources of knowledge not available through the ordinary rate of vibration of thought. Are there known sources of knowledge which are available only to genii? And if so, what are these sources, and exactly how may they be reached? Genius is developed through the sixth sense. The reality of the sixth sense has been fairly well established. This sixth sense is creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is one which the majority of people never use during an entire lifetime, and if used at all, it usually happens by mere accident. A relatively small number of people use, with deliberation and purpose of forethought, the faculty of creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is the direct link between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence. All so-called revelations referred to in the realm of religion, and all discoveries of basic or new principles in the field of invention, take place through the faculty of creative imagination. The creative imagination functions best when the mind is vibrating due to some form of mind stimulation at an exceedingly high rate, that is, when the mind is functioning at a rate of vibration higher than that of ordinary normal thought. When brain action has been stimulated, it has the effect of lifting the individual far above the horizon of ordinary thought. When lifted to this higher level of thought, through any form of mind stimulation, an individual occupies, relatively, the same position as one who has ascended in an airplane to a height from which he may see over and beyond the horizon line, which limits his vision while on the ground. Moreover, while on this higher level of thought, the individual is not hampered or bound by any of the stimuli which circumscribe and limit his vision while wrestling with the problems of gaining the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter. He is in a world of thought in which the ordinary workaday thoughts have been as effectively removed as are the hills and valleys and other limitations of physical vision when he rises in an airplane. While on this exalted plane of thought, the creative faculty of the mind is given freedom for action. The way has been cleared for the sixth sense to function. It becomes receptive to ideas which could not reach the individual under any other circumstances. The sixth sense is the faculty which marks the difference between a genius and an ordinary individual. The creative faculty becomes more alert and receptive to vibrations originating outside the individual's subconscious mind. The more this faculty is used and the more the individual relies upon it and makes demands upon it for thought impulses. This faculty can be cultivated and developed only through use. That which is known as one's conscious operates entirely through the faculty of the sixth sense. The great artists, writers, musicians, and poets become great because they acquire the habit of relying upon the still small voice which speaks from within through the faculty of creative imagination. The method by which he does this varies with the individual, but this is the sum and substance of his procedure. He stimulates his mind so that it vibrates on a higher than average plane. He concentrates upon the known factors the finished part of his invention and creates in his mind a perfect picture of unknown factors, the unfinished part of his invention. He holds this picture in his mind until it has been taken over by the subconscious mind, then relaxes by clearing his mind of all thought and waits for his answers to flash into his mind. Sometimes the results are both definite and immediate. At other times the results are negative, depending upon the state of development of the sixth sense or creative faculty. The human mind responds to stimulation. Among the greatest and most powerful of these stimuli is the urge of sex. When harnessed and transmuted, this driving force is capable of lifting men into that higher sphere of thought which enables them to master the sources of worry and petty annoyance which beset their pathway on the lower plane. Chief among the stimuli with which this stepping up of the vibrations may be produced is sex energy. The mere possession of this energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Far from becoming genii, 
Because of great sex desires, the majority of men lower themselves, through misunderstanding and misuse of this great force, to the status of the lower animals. A mind stimulant is any influence which will either temporarily or permanently increase the vibrations of thought. Nature has prepared her own potions with which men may safely stimulate their minds so they vibrate on a plane that enables them to tune in to fine and rare thoughts which come from no man knows where. No satisfactory substitute for nature's stimulants has ever been found. It is a fact well known to psychologists that there is a very close relationship between sex desires and spiritual urges, a fact which accounts for the peculiar behavior of people who participate in the orgies known as religious revivals. Through these sources one may commune with an infinite intelligence or enter at will the storehouse of the subconscious mind, either one's own or that of another person, a procedure which is all there is of genius. But the factor of personality known as personal magnetism is nothing more or less than sex energy. Highly sexed people always have a plentiful supply of magnetism. Through cultivation and understanding, this vital force may be drawn upon and used to great advantage in the relationships between people. Transmutation of sex energy calls for more willpower than the average person cares to use for this purpose. Those who find it difficult to summon willpower sufficient for transmutation may gradually acquire this ability. Though this requires willpower, the reward for the practice is more than worth the effort. These statements of the virtue of sex energy should not be construed as justification for the libertine. The emotion of sex is a virtue only when used intelligently and with discrimination. It may be misused and often is to such an extent that it debases instead of enriches both body and mind. Intemperance in sex habits is just as detrimental as intemperance in habits of drinking and eating. No man can avail himself of the forces of his creative imagination while dissipating them. Sex alone is a mighty urge to action, but its forces are like a cyclone. They are often uncontrollable. When the emotion of love begins to mix itself with the emotion of sex, the result is calmness of purpose, poise, accuracy of judgment, and balance. When driven by his desire to please a woman, based solely upon the emotion of sex, a man may be, and usually is, capable of great achievement, but his actions may be disorganized, distorted, and totally destructive. When driven by his desire to please a woman, based upon the motive of sex alone, a man may steal, cheat, and even commit murder. But when the emotion of love is mixed with the emotion of sex, that same man will guide his actions with more sanity, balance, and reason. Criminologists have discovered that the most hardened criminals can be reformed through the influence of a woman's love. There is no record of a criminal having been reformed solely through the sex influence. Love, romance, and sex are all emotions capable of driving men to heights of super-achievement. Love is the emotion which serves as a safety valve and ensures balance, poise, and constructive effort. When combined, these three emotions may lift one to an altitude of a genius. The emotion of love brings out and develops the artistic and aesthetic nature of man. It leaves its impress upon one's very soul even after the fire has been subdued by time and circumstance. Memories of love never pass. They linger, guide, and influence long after the source of stimulation has faded. There is nothing new in this. Every person who has been moved by genuine love knows that it leaves enduring traces upon the human heart. The effect of love endures because love is spiritual in nature. Even the memories of love are sufficient to lift one to a higher plane of creative effort. The major force of love may spend itself and pass away, like a fire which has burned itself out, but it leaves behind indelible marks as evidence that it has passed that way. Its departure often prepares the human heart for a still greater love. Go back into your yesteryears at times, and bathe your mind in the beautiful memories of past love. It will soften the influence of the present worries and annoyances. It will give you a source of escape from the unpleasant realities of life, and maybe, who knows, your mind will yield to you, during this temporary retreat into the world of fantasy, ideas or plans which may change the entire financial or spiritual status of your life. 
If you believe yourself unfortunate because you have loved and lost, perish the thought. One who has loved truly can never lose entirely. Love is whimsical and temperamental. Its nature is ephemeral and transitory. It comes when it pleases and goes away without warning. Accept and enjoy it while it remains, but spend no time worrying about its departure. Worry will never bring it back. Dismiss also the thought that love never comes but once. Love may come and go, times without number, but there are no two love experiences which affect one in just the same way. There may be, and there usually is, one love experience which leaves a deeper imprint on the heart than all the others. But all love experiences are beneficial except to the person who becomes resentful and cynical when love makes its departure. There should be no disappointment over love, and there would be none if people understood the difference between the emotions of love and sex. The major difference is that love is spiritual, while sex is biological. No experience which touches the human heart with a spiritual force can possibly be harmful, except through ignorance or jealousy. Love is, without question, life's greatest experience. It brings one into communication with infinite intelligence. When mixed with the emotions of romance and sex, it may lead one far up the ladder of creative effort. Marriages, not blessed with the eternal affinity of love, properly balanced and proportioned with sex, cannot be happy ones, and seldom endure. Love alone will not bring happiness in marriage, nor will sex alone. When these two beautiful emotions are blended, marriage may bring about a state of mind closest to the spiritual that one may ever know on this earthly plane. When the emotion of romance is added to those of love and sex, the obstructions between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence are removed. The woman who understands man's nature and tactfully caters to it need have no fear of competition from other women. Men may be giants with indomitable willpower when dealing with other men, but they are easily managed by the woman of their choice. Most men will not admit that they are easily influenced by the women they prefer because it is in the nature of the male to want to be recognized as the stronger of the species. Moreover, the intelligent woman recognizes this manly trait and very wisely makes no issue of it. Some men know that they are being influenced by the women of their choice, but they tactfully refrain from rebelling against the influence because they are intelligent enough to know that no man is happy or complete without the modifying influence of the right woman. The man who does not recognize this important truth deprives himself of the power which has done more to help men achieve success than all other forces combined. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist and author. My published books are available on Amazon.com. Kindly check them out if you're interested in the material I cover in these videos. I appreciate all of the Patreon subscribers. And to those who have made a donation to Atlantean Gardens, thank you very much. And to those who contribute their time and effort by sharing these videos, I thank you very much as well. So please leave me a comment, let me know your thoughts, be safe, and I will see you again soon.